sponsors now want to see what you're doing in terms of diversity and inclusion and social issues. They want to know that you're not just focused on on field success. They want to know that you've got um, you're, you're responsible in terms of social issues and that um, you know having an, an all male middle aged board is not going to cut it with some sponsors anymore. Some sponsors will mark you on these things. And I think that's another reason why it's so important in terms of sustainability and commercial growth. Yeah, it's like a bigger picture, isn't it? There's a much yeah. bigger picture. Yeah, great. Uh, Amber, can I, can, I give, can I give that one to you as well, if that's all right? So why do you think it's so important to push for diversity and leadership roles and positions in the sports industry? Yeah, I think like Laura said, like it's really important both from like a leadership perspective, so you get loads of different ideas. If you've got the same people putting the same ideas out there, mm -hmm. how are you going to grow and evolve as a business? You're not really. Uh, I think as well, um, just like thinking about Aston Villa, like where we are based, like our demographic is very, very diverse. So if we want to service our community that's based around Villa Park, then we need to have people that know what that community wants um and if we haven't got people within the business that that know that then how can we service them um and then just touching on um sponsorship as well like it is absolutely massive like especially in women's football there's a lot of um partners that want to get involved and they want to get involved for the right reasons i think um at villa it was really important for us this year to not have a betting brand um on the front of our shirt so we have Kazoo um, and yeah, we've kind of taken a hit on that because betting companies give you a lot, a lot of money to go on the front of the shirt. But for us, it was important that we had Kazoo. So A, we could wear it as a women's team because if we have under 18 players, they can't wear it. So we look mismatched. We've got players that are old enough to wear Kazoo on the front and then some players don't. Also as well, come back to role models that we spoke about earlier and in your previous session. Kids want to wear the same shirt as Jack Grealish and Jodie Hutton. So they want to wear a shirt that's got Kazoo on. Um, so, yeah, it's really important for, for sponsors as well. And I think that's why I, women's football is quite um, fashionable at the minute, shall I say, because we're doing quite a lot of stuff behind the scenes that does service the community. So, like, we've just got Cabras on board with us now because we're really keen on giving dual, dual careers to the players. So at any moment in time, they can get injured and what are they going to fall back on? So Cabras are supporting us with working with uni so players can train, be a professional football, but also get a degree at the end of it. Um, so yeah, I think diversity is is massive and yeah, you definitely do mucking <laughs> in football. There's definitely rolling sleeves up and mucking. So yeah, I think it's really, really important. Great. Yeah. And I totally, I, I, I echo what you said, what you both said about, it's all about having more strengths in the pot, isn't it? You know, strengths, whether it be male, female, it's just about having more strengths that, that, that an industry can then, you know, can then make, make, well, utilize, you know, whether it's a club or whether it's the wider industry. Okay, so Laura, this is a question specifically for you, if that's okay. So yep. where do you feel the women's game in Scotland is in comparison to England? Um, and obviously with the national team when the last World Cup, which was a huge milestone, how has that maybe changed the, um, I suppose, changed the landscape? There's definitely more interest in women's football. We are still lagging behind England. Um, we don't have a fully professional league. We have SWPL1, which has the likes of Rangers and Celtic, um, Hibernian, etc., but um, and Glasgow City, of course. But the the vast majority of the teams that are in that league are not professional. They're still um, amateur. They still have full time jobs. They train at night. And um, the football's, you know, something on the side for them as much as they would love it to be um, full time. The, I, I suspect the wages that the clubs would be able to pay would be less than what what they're currently earning just now. And I think that's one of the major barriers. Um, you know, for us, we don't have the, the BT Sport broadcasting deal that the WSL has down in England. We There's still not the, the kind of sponsorship and the broadcasting revenue is still not there. And a lot of clubs are just not willing to 
kind of, especially in this climate, put the money in to make a loss. Um, I think a, a lot of us have um, been using this period to try and work out what we can do to kind of gain more interest in the women's side from, from our own fans. Um, so because we've all kind of revamped our club TVs because fans aren't allowed in, we're showing women's football on the club TV to try and garner a wee bit more interest. And we're showing, we're showing that for free just now. Um, but it's, I mean, it's getting there. There's, there's definitely more interest, and I think it will get there. Um, there's, I've, I've just recently joined the, the committee of our women's team. Our, our women's team currently sits with the community trust, and I've recently joined um, joined that as we kind of move towards the transition of the women's club coming under the main club and the umbrella, and we'll, we'll run it from, from in-house. Um, so it's a really exciting time, but... I mean, for me, I think one of the major issues, especially for Scotland, and I'm not sure what Amber's thoughts on this would be, is that we still have this issue, and we have it on the men's side as well, that with Scotland being so close to England and England always being the platform that it is in terms of having having more revenue in football, um, whether it be in the men's or the women's, we lose a lot of our players. We lose them at a young age to English clubs. And right now, one of the issues that the women's clubs have is that they don't get any compensation for the training and development of their players. You know, a lot of them don't have them on professional contracts, so they can't demand transfer fees. And you don't get training compensation like you do in the men's game. The reason you don't get training compensation is because FIFA is of the view that if you offered training compensation just now, it would deter the development of the women's game. It would slow down transfers and whatnot. And I can understand that to an extent, but my view is that, and I don't know if you cover training compensation, Joanna, in any of the, the courses that, that you offer, um, but training compensation is basically compensation that clubs can demand out with a transfer fee that recognises the training and development that has gone into young players. It's, pay, it's paid between you know certain age groups, um, and it's you, you get it for the men, but you don't get it for the women, and, and that is becoming... A bit of a barrier for us in developing our players because you know the the, the the clubs that are amateur just can't develop to that level because they keep losing their key players and then they don't have any kind of money to compensate for all the training and development that they put into these players and then have to find the cash again to to train their existing players and go out and find new players and it's it really is a deterrent it's debilitating for a lot of them um I mean, for instance, even you know some of some of the the women players that are in the Scotland squad and that qualified for um, the, the the tournament last year, they you know I I know I know one that that had been with a Scottish club for all of her youth career for the best part of eight nine years, and the club she went to a WSL club. And and the, and the Scottish club got nothing, nothing at all. Couldn't demand a transfer fee. Couldn't get training compensation. And I I, I think that I feel strongly that that's wrong. Um, and I don't know, Amber. I'd actually really be interested to hear your thoughts on that. <laughs> yeah. So um, I agree on the training compensation. Like it has been an issue. And we have had quite a lot of uh, meetings um, before COVID around what that looked like and what that was going to look like and then obviously our uh, meetings changed to what transfers were going to look like after Brexit but that was quite a big topic beforehand and for me like um, us at Villa like we're really strong about um, developing our own players and like I can give you an example like we had a player Ebony Salmon she's been with us for a long long time and then as soon as Man United went professional they took her from us um, and that was it we didn't get anything for her um, We've got a lot of players that we've developed at Villa that are now playing at like some of the top four or five clubs and we've got no money for them. And it is really um, is really disappointing because you invest in that player and you spend a lot of time with that player and you invest a lot of money into your academies. And then for those players to be taken away from you is, is, is quite harsh. Um, the reason is, is because you can't put them on a contract until they're 18. Um, 
But what happens is, is some of the players are getting agents before they're 18 and they're already talking to clubs and you don't know about it. And then next thing you know, their 18th birthday come down there with a contract and they're like, oh, by the way, I'm off to Chelsea. And you just think, oh, like, um, missed out on that. And, it, and it's happened to me quite a lot um, in terms of players going elsewhere and you, don't, and you don't get anything for it. I can understand to a certain extent because if it's a grassroots, I don't know, it's a bit difficult. Like, where, where, like, who invested in that? Where does the money go to in terms of that? How much does that player need to cost? Um, because let's say us as an, R, um, an RTC, so a regional talent club, we have um, players at 16. If they then come out at 16 and they want to go to, I don't know, like a national league team that doesn't have any money, where do those players go? Because if I'm saying, oh, actually, you owe us three grand for this player, does that mean that then participation goes down even more because they're not ready to go to a club that can afford it? And that's the only thing that I think is a barrier. Otherwise, I think it does need to come into play. I don't know. It's a, it's a messy topic. Mean, in my opinion, you'd set it up the way you set up the male training compensation system, but with different figures. So if, for instance, uh, a player goes from your club to a club that is considered to be uh, you know, less resourceful, less financially resourceful, or from a, a lower league, if you like. So just now the male training compensation system is categorised into four different categories. And say, for instance, we had a player that went from Dundee United, which is a Category 2 club, to Category 4 club, then the, the training compensation is completely different. It's 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 calculated. They don't owe training compensation from, from recollection if it's a Category 4. But again, they they have smaller amounts to pay depending on what category the club is. So, for instance, a Premier League club just now is classed at €90,000 per season. Category 2 is €60,000 for male footballers obviously you wouldn't class that for for women's football but you can you can you know pitch at, at smaller figures and set up the system that way and i think that would help the development of the game but still reward clubs like scottish clubs and and your own club amber especially be considering i mean the the male training compensation was challenged in the european court of justice um and the European Court of Justice ruled that, you know, it wasn't seen to be a restraint of trade. You know, it wasn't deterring movement of players or movement of workers, as they call it, under EU law, um, because in actual fact, you can restrain movement so long as you have a legitimate objective. And the legitimate objective was, Amber, what you were talking about, incentivising clubs to run academies and not just to have a star first team. Without training compensation, clubs will not develop youngsters. They won't develop players because they just they'll just lose them all for nothing. And I think that's really key for the development of women's football, in my opinion, not just in Scotland but you know across other leagues as well. Joanna, well, yeah, you've that's seen really interesting. Football, haven't you? I'm sorry, I'm uh, oh, sorry, I was going to say you've seen it. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. They've got rid of their academies just because it's too much money, um, and they're not getting any anything back for them. So, yeah, we'll see what happens really with that one. It's really interesting to see the comparison, isn't it? And, you know, there, there is a direct comparison just because the, the accessibility of going from um, England to Scotland and there's a big, there's, a, there's you know, there's a big difference and it is a really interesting conversation. But I suppose keeping within, I suppose, within the change, the changing um, landscape of not just women's football, but football in general, with the past year of COVID-19 and the differences. Um, Amber, this is a question for you, if that's OK. Um, mm -hmm. The WSL continues to grow at a really fast pace on and off the pitch. But is there a fear that the pandemic could slow that down or have a negative effect on that development? Um, I think because we've been fortunate enough to carry on um, carry on with our games and our fixtures, mm. I think there hasn't necessarily been a slowdown. Am I disappointed that we didn't get the big massive ceremony when we got promoted to the Super League? Yeah, we had to do our little um, presentation with the players and promotion party on Zoom. That was a bit strange. Um, but I think with the FA player now and with BT Sport, I think football is really accessible now, especially women's football. And I think 
the pandemic has kind of maybe given us a bit more of an advantage and more opportunity for people to sit down and watch women's football because there's not really much else to watch at the minute. Um, everyone's kind of watched all the Netflix series throughout lockdown, so it's why not watch women's football? And I think it's a great stepping stone. Like I always use the analogy of you would never just go to see Dua Lipa in concert straight away. You'd maybe watch a listen to her on Spotify, Apple Music to start off with, then maybe watch her on YouTube for a bit before you then um, went and bought a ticket to watch her at a concert. So I think the anticipation of live sport as well, eventually when we can allow fans back to the stadiums, I'm hoping that we'll have more people coming to watch because they've been watching us on FA Player, they've built that relationship with us and they've been following us online and now they want to come to a game and also they just want to get out. Like, they're bored of sitting in their houses. So I think, yeah, it was growing a lot before and we had a really good attendance at games and stuff. And it is a shame that the pandemic kind of put that to a halt. But I think this time has given us an opportunity to like reset ourselves, really focus on getting fans watching online, ready for when gates open that they'll come to games. But I think it I think it's good. Yeah. Great. So yeah, yeah. See, so it's been negative in some in some ways, but then obviously mm. it might have positive effects longer term. Great. And actually, we have a linked a linked question in the chat from uh, Mia, who says, "What do you think needs to change to close the gap within the teams in the WSL?" Um, for me, I think it's commercial sponsorships. So, mm. um, again, like you said it earlier, Laura, like there's teams take a lot of a lot take a loss on the women's team because they're not generating enough money at the moment um, especially now with ticket sales that like we can't sell any tickets to our games so I think it's closing the gap with commercial sponsorships like Chelsea they have so many sponsorships around their women's team that they're kind of almost becoming sustainable themselves and they're not they don't need any money from the men's team so I think clubs need to start tapping into their brand and their USP in terms of their women's team and make them more sustainable and bring in their own income so they don't need to rely on the men's team. So I think we've kind of focused on that this year at, at Villa. So Cadbury's, we've brought them in as our own sponsor. Kappa also, obviously the, the logo is a man and a woman back to back. So our sponsorship split 50-50, 50% goes to the men, 50% goes to the women. Same with Kazoo, because obviously we're, we wear Kazoo as well as the men. They give us a chunk of money too. So I think commercial sponsorship is massive in order to close the gap, just so you can bring in more money to get better players and better facilities.